Oh, today we're going to talk about selfish gravity, and I want to tell you what I mean by that. I don't know anybody who else has said that, but I, I kind of coined that a few years ago. I was a science teacher, and one of the things that in science that you realize is that gravity affects things. And as you get older, you realize that too. I, I went and visited a guy in the hospital the other day, and the reason I visited him in the hospital is he's older, and he thought he could walk upstairs with a handful of chairs, two chairs in each hand. He thought he could walk upstairs, and he found that gravity took place, and he is now in the hospital. And so he's fine. He's going to be fine. So that's why I can harass him and make fun of him and tell him you're not 20 years old anymore. And the thing is, when you were 20, you'd fall too. It just didn't hurt as much. There's something about when you get older, you're like, why am I bruising? Oh, yeah, I walked into a cabinet. You know, that used to be nothing. It used to bounce off of stuff. And um, anyway, so selfish gravity is this idea. It's the idea that even when you become a Christian, even when you give your life to Christ, and the Bible says you become a brand new creature, that as long as we're in this world, I know it's hot in here. Somebody turned the heat up to 73. I don't know which of you evil people thought that was a good idea. But anyway, it'll cool off. So, oh wow, I'm really ADD today. It could be a problem. Here's the deal. No matter, although your life has been changed, although you have been made a new creation, because we're in this world, there's always this pull from without to selfishness and self-centeredness. You know, just like this morning when I was on the way here and I found myself discouraged. And the reason I was discouraged is I was thinking about me and my teaching and my power and my this and my that. And then God reminds me, hey, did you forget? It's not about you. And just like David saw Goliath already defeated, not because David was strong enough. We need to go through life and realize, you know what, God, this is the circumstance I see that looks bigger than I can handle. And God, you've given me more than I can handle. Every once in a while, says, somebody says, God can't give you more than he can handle. I don't think David could handle Goliath. I'm just saying, I don't think that was a natural battle, regardless of what Seth Godin says. I, 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 it was not a natural battle. The truth is that there's times in life that it's too much for you, but it's never too much for him. And so you say, God, let me see what you see and not focus on me, but focus on what you can do, even in the middle of this horribleness. It's just not a word. Now, today we're going to pick up again in the book of Romans. We're going to talk about this selfish gravity that's always pulling at us. And I'm going to talk about how to deal with selfish gravity. That's going to be our focus. And I'm going to give you three points today. Um, but I want to tell you a story first or, a true, or, a, or facts that you didn't, maybe didn't know. What is this called? Steak, some of your favorite dinner, but not this, right? That's why English is confusing. Anyway, so when elephants are small, what they used to do, I don't know if they even still do this, but when elephants were little, they would take a steak and put it in the ground and tie a rope on the leg of the baby elephant. And the baby elephant would pull and pull and pull to get away from that steak and could not get away from it, got stuck to it. It would actually... Uh, uh, make its leg bleed. It would stop. And what they discovered is as the elephant grew, they could use the same size steak. Now it was bigger than this one, but they could use the same size steak, even though at this point, a full grown elephant can lift 2000 pounds. It could pick up your car and yet a small steak put in the ground with a rope on it. The elephant wouldn't move because in its mind, the elephant thought, I can't move that stake. I remember that I couldn't move it and I still can't listen. You have an enemy who tries to tell you all the time, you are what you used to be. Amen. And you're not. You're full grown now. When God takes over, you are a new creation. No longer does sin. Boy, I, I got to be careful. I threw this last night. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> distracted myself. That's really bad. What was I talking about? Something about a steak or something. But the enemy, listen, the enemy wants to lie to you and tell you that you are overcome. You, you can't overcome that area. You just need to give in to whatever your sin is. Hey, you were built that way. You were born that way. Your parents were that way. You've always been angry. You've always been grumpy. You've always been mean. You've never been a nice person. You've never been able to do this. You've never been able to do that. Listen, 
You're, you're just like Moses. You show up and God says, hey, I want to use you to speak. And Moses goes, I don't speak so well. And God says, well, I'll speak for you. And he goes, that's not good enough either. That's us. We argue with God about what he made us to do. And here's the deal. God has created you to be a new person. And yes, there's times in life that you do things you didn't want to do and you don't do what you want to do. But the truth is God has set you free. And too often we live in bondage that's not even ours anymore. We live a life that we no longer live. We think we're somebody we're not. And as Paul gets to these chapters in Romans, I told you every week in Romans, I was going to tell you one more thing about the book of Romans. And here it is. One of the things you need to recognize is that before the book of Romans was written, not long before this, uh, uh, they had kicked all the Jews out of Rome. The Jews were all kicked out. They were sent back to Jerusalem. So Jerusalem all of a sudden had a refugee problem and they had a financial problem. Part of the reason Paul wrote the book of Romans was to collect money. Also, he was going, and going to collect money for the church in Jerusalem. Because the church and the Jewish people who had come from Jerusalem were now starving and hungry. There weren't enough jobs. It was a refugee crisis. Well, now, those people now, about the time the book of Romans were written, were allowed to go back to Rome. So Christians who had never met a Jew, all of a sudden were meeting Jewish Christians. And they didn't understand each other at all. And so you, that's a surprise, isn't it? That we don't understand another culture. And, and, and so you had Jewish Christians coming who practiced Judaism and Christianity. And Paul said that was fine. They practiced those old ways. But then you had uh, Greeks and Romans who didn't do those things and were new Christians and didn't understand. So in some cases, the Jewish people would say, hey, you need to obey all the Jewish laws. But then there was this Roman group called the Gnostics who thought knowledge was everything. They said it doesn't matter what you do with your body as long as your mind is right. They basically were the, were the as long as you're sincere, it's okay. You know, whatever you do is okay. How could it be so wrong when it feels so right? Olivia Newton-John, sorry, that was very 70s of me to throw that out there. But anyway, so, so you know, and that's the whole thing. And so Paul is dealing with this in the book of Romans and he's saying to these people, hey, it's not about the law. And it's not about doing whatever you want. Both of those lead to death. And then as we come into this chapter today, and we're actually going to talk about two chapters. As we get into chapter 6 today, we're going to look at what happens when we exchange sin, the life of sin or the life of law for the gift that God has given us. What does that look like? So here we go. Number one, how do I, how do I get rid of selfish gravity? Number one, die to selfish living. How? By his gift of new life. Paul picks up this chapter by saying this. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And remember I talked about those people who said, we can do whatever we want as long as we're sincere. And Paul's like, nay, nay. Nay, nay. He says, by no means, which is the same as nay, nay. And then he says, we are those who've died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? I'm about to turn on the air conditioner. Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus... All right, now i got to get to talking. Here we go. woo Yeah, thanks for that. My wife put you up to that. All right. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were, therefore... Listen to this. Buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Time out. I want to tell you about this. So we baptize as a church. If you don't know that, there's a baptismal out here. It's not hard to miss. If you drive past, some of you have never gone this far. But if you drive past here, the baptistry's outside. We actually have a bell that people ring afterwards, which was here before us. It's very country, but it's tradition. So we like to do it, and it's really cool when you get out of the pool. You bang! Anyway, so baptism, what is Baptism. Baptism is an outward symbol of what's happened in my heart. Baptism is the wedding ring of the Christian life. You can put a wedding ring on if you're single. Might be a good idea for some of you women, although I've heard that guys, there are guys who hit on women who have rings on, they should be punched in the face. But that's another story. Uh, did I say all that out loud? Some of that was meant to stay inside. It, it, so the baptism is the wedding ring of the Christian life. It shows what's already happened in your heart. It's not the baptism that saves you. The thief on the cross was never baptized. The thief on the cross, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say after you get a couple things right when we get to heaven, we'll straighten it out. He said, no, no, today, now, that's next. 
And so here's the deal. And by the way, that was a last minute confession. People say, can people confess last minute? This guy knew he was dying, looked at Jesus, said, you're the truth. You're the way. And, and Jesus said, okay, come with me. I mean, that's awesome. And I'm like, that's hope for all of us. So baptism is, is a symbol of dying to yourself. I'm dying. I'm tired of living for me. I've been living for me my whole life. All I think about is me, 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 my, 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 my stuff, my things, the way I want to do. I'm dying to me. And then what am I doing? I'm resurrected, just like Jesus, to live for him. That old person, that old way, that old tie down to sin, that person I used to be, it's gone. It's gone. And we've got to remember that. And so Paul's reminding them of this symbol to remind them. And by the way, when you watch someone else get baptized, it should remind you of the freedom that you have. And then it continues. We were therefore buried. I already said all that. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we'll certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. What he's talking about? He's talking about heaven. For we all know our old self was crucified with his body. The body ruled by sin may be done away with. We should no longer be tied or slaves to sin. Because anyone has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we'll believe we'll live with him. What is that talking about? Heaven. It's talking about heaven. So we have the hope of heaven. By the way, I, I do funerals all the time. I don't know how people survive believing that there's just nothing else. I mean, it's awesome to me to think. And we have to make choices about that. What do you really believe about eternity will impact what you do today? What you believe about eternity will impact what you do today. So you need to realize, am I believing the wrong thing about eternity? It impacts today. And am I believing the wrong thing about myself? Am I one of these people walking around saying, I'm just a sinner. And we just keep pursuing. I just do what my parents did. I'm the same as my daddy. By the way, you hear my Georgia background come out when I say that. By the way, let me just tell you how country my family is. One of my favorite stories my dad used to tell. He was about three years old. He stuck a chickpea in his ear. His uncle, his uncle came, said, come over here, boy, and tried to blow it out from the other side. That's a true story. All right. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself as an instrument to wickedness. I'm going to come back to this. You're going to hear this the whole time. This is a prayer that he's getting ready to pray. Listen to this. Instead, rather, offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life. And listen to this. This is a prayer right here. Offer Every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. I'm going to come back to that, so hang on to it. For sin shall no longer be your master. Because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. So it talked about sin, it talked about the law, but what are you under? Grace. You're not tied to this stake anymore. You have freedom. And then a few verses later, but now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the benefit you lead, reap leads to holiness. So when you really have a relationship with God, what does it do? It changes you from the inside out, not from the outside in. And the result is, we're back to heaven, eternal life. By the way, eternal life starts now, not later. And then this is the most famous passage in this passage. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The payment for what you do the payment for the best works you can do, you will still mess it up. That payment is death. But God looked at you and he said, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to get there. You don't have to try to make it to me. It's a gift. It's a gift. And we have to receive that gift. But the truth is, a lot of times we hang on to this old person. The way we used to do things. Let me give you your first, first encouragement. And then I'm going to go back to that passage. I want to encourage you first to learn to exhale in life. When you get up in the morning to take time to, to say, God, is there any sin in my life? When you wake up and all you're thinking about is yourself and your worries and your problems and your struggles to say to God, God, forgive me for thinking I can do this. God, forgive me that I, that for thinking that somehow I'm going to overcome this. God, forgive me for just thinking about myself too much. And then like the verse says, offering every part of your body to him. Lord, you know, with my mind yesterday, I had some thoughts when I was driving on I-4. Right? Or when I saw that co-worker, oh, I'm just trying, right? So, Lord, I confess that to you. Would you make my mind an instrument of righteousness? 
Lord, yesterday, that thing that I said, I, 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 I was gossiping. I, I was saying those things I knew I shouldn't be. And I, but I knew it, but boy, it felt good just to, just to get it out. I was just venting. I was just venting, right? That's what we say. We're just venting. God, forgive me for not using my tongue that you gave me. Help that to be an instrument of righteousness. Lord, forgive me for listening to that conversation or those things that I shouldn't have been listening to. God, I exhale. I give that to you. I surrender that to you. Lord, forgive me for typing what I typed to that person. Thank you that you helped me to delete it before I sent it. Right? Hopefully you do that. You ever seen the one with Kermit the Frog? If, you ever, if you're ever typing like that, it means you're in trouble. Don't, don't send that, whatever that was. So die to selfish living by his gift of new life. So what do you do? God, I say, thank you. God, I die to me. God, I give you all that stuff, all those worries. God, I give you all the good things, all the victories. They're not mine. I'm not good enough to do that. I, God, you know, in my flesh... I don't know if you've ever been accused of being a jerk. I've been accused of being a jerk. And all I can say is, yeah, <laughs> sometimes. But God, thank you that you can forgive me when I'm a jerk. When I say something that I didn't mean to say or didn't say the way I wanted to say. Just put it out there before him. It's okay. It's okay. Number dose. Remember that you belong to Christ. You belong to me. Remember that song that was very scary. It's kind of a. Weird song. It's almost as bad as every breath you take. If you put every breath you take and you belong to me, that is a psychotic person's dream songs right there. If you don't know either of those songs, Google them later. So here's the deal. You belong to Christ and you have to remember that. Why? Because we constantly get images and thoughts in our minds that we're not who we think we are. Now, how many of you have ever been to a pawn shop? I'm not going to ask if you sold anything there. How many of you have ever been to a pawn shop? All right. So here's the way a pawn shop works, if I understand it right. I've never done this <laughs> yet. Uh, so, so basically, you take something in. Let's say you take a set of golf clubs in, and you go, hey, I want to borrow against these golf clubs for a month. And they'll give you a, basically a loan. And tell me if I got this wrong. They give you a loan. They charge you interest for the month. Is that right? Is that the way it works? Okay. Charge you interest for a month. If you don't go in a month and pay off your stuff, what happens to your stuff? They sell it, right? And then a new owner gets it, correct? So how many of you have been to pawn shop and bought something? You bought something from a pawn shop? I have. I bought something from a pawn shop. All right. And it was only a little hot. It was fine. It was in Miami. Um, anyway, so that's a joke. It really wasn't. really wasn't. So, so I don't think. I don't, not that I know of. Anyway, so, so I, I, the serial numbers were scratched off, but I wasn't worried about that. I thought, no, I'm just kidding. Those are all, those are all jokes. Not very good ones, but there they are. Okay, so, so Lord, confess the righteousness. All right, so... Um, so here's the thing. You go to a pawn shop. What? Somebody else owns it. Here's the deal. If the other owner comes back and goes, hey, those are my golf clubs. You're like, well, do you steal them? No, I took them to the pawn shop and traded them in. Well, they're not yours anymore. I bought them. In Revelation, it talks about how Jesus, through his blood, paid more than, than anyone could ever pay for you. It's the idea that you were on the trading block and Satan was bidding. And Jesus says, my blood. And Satan's like, oh, I can't outbid that. And yet we become Christians and we forget whose we are. And we walk in discouragement and defeat and we feel frustrated and we get sad and, and, and we allow life and we start thinking of ourselves way too much. And we forget who really owns us. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, your old selves died. And you became free from the law through the body of Christ. Quit trying to give your old self CPR. This happened so you might belong to someone else. The one who was raised from the dead. Talking about Jesus. And so we might be used in service to God. Isn't that awesome? It's not just talking about pastors and teachers and all that. You. God wants to use you to serve for service. He can use you to be a blessing today. In your darkest hour, in your worst time in life, even during that time, God can use you. You know how I know that? Because I've seen it. I've seen God use people in their darkest, toughest, biggest struggle. A lady with brain cancer that I went to visit stopped me and said, are you okay? And I said, oh, I haven't been feeling good, but I wasn't going to talk about that. She said, let me pray for you. Can you top that one? 
God can use you right where you're at. In the past, we were ruled by our sinful selves. Basically, we didn't have any control. And then it continues, the law made us want to do sinful things that controlled our bodies. So the things we did were bringing us death. In the past, the law held us like prisoners, but our old selves died and we were made free from the law. So now we serve God in a new way with the spirit and not in the old way with written rules. What does that mean? That means you don't have to just carry verses around on your head. God's going to bring them to your heart. Now, when you're listening to the Holy Spirit in your life, the, the key is it always should line up with Scripture. God's not going to tell you to do something that doesn't line up with His Word. You know, you're not going to hear, go punch that person in the face. If you do, that's you. And you've had too much caffeine or something. I don't know, right? And so, or, you, or you have an anger problem, right? So, so what does that mean? So it means I listen to the Holy Spirit everywhere I go and everything I do. And I say, God, would you... Fill me with your spirit. That's the next encouragement to you, to inhale. God, fill me. (sighs) Fill me with your spirit. Lord, I exhale. I put all those things, those negative, those those selfish, those those sins in my life, I put all those before you. (sighs) And Lord, I ask you, fill me with your spirit. Help me to live a life worthy of the calling you've given me. Lord, show me what I need to do today. Because here's the deal. When you are walking in selfishness, you don't do anything for anyone else. Anything you do for somebody else is actually for you. You might be pretending it's for them, but the truth is it's for you. Does that make sense? That's why we do angry dishes. Right? I'm doing this because I love you children, and you just feel good. No, you're not. You're doing it because you're mad, and you want to make a point. Let's just be honest about it. Well, I do love my children. Well, I know you love them, but not at that right that minute. What's in your heart's not love and cookies, right? It's not, okay? And so you do angry dishes. Why? Because the truth is what you're thinking is nobody else does the dishes. I'm the only one who does anything around here. Me, me, me. And by the way, usually when we get mad, it has to do with us thinking about ourselves a little too highly. Not that I've ever done angry dishes. You should hear me. I could put them in the dishwasher and wake up the whole house. I'm amazing, impressive. Kids never do any dishes around here. I'll show them. They sleep right through it. They have no idea. So I've actually learned, you know what one of the secrets is? Hey, guys, if the dishes aren't done, and I don't get mad, the dishes aren't done, the internet is going to quit working. And I can get the house vacuumed. I can, amazing. I love technology. You don't have to beat kids. People are like, wow, when I was a kid, I got spanked. Listen, all you got to do now is go, I'm taking your iPhone. And the kids are like, what do you need me to do? You are now my puppet. (laughs) I just stepped on a lot of toes. All right. The law made us want to do sinful things that controlled our bodies. I already read all this. Inhale. Ask God to fill you with his spirit. Why? Because there's always a fake review. If you get on Amazon anymore, they have people paid to write reviews. So you don't know what to believe. As a Christian, you've got to be careful that you're not listening to fake reviews. The enemy will tell you, you're no good, you're lousy, you can't do anything. It's about you. They don't want to respect you. You shouldn't do anything else for them. By the way, whenever you're doing something to help people, the enemy will come and tell you, nobody appreciates you. Do you see how they treated you? And it becomes about you. You want want to get upset? Go help in the children's ministry. What? What do you mean you want to get upset helping the children's ministry? Well, you can have joy if you do it for the Lord. But if you go in there thinking that everybody's going to think you're the most wonderful thing since sliced bread, guess what? You got another thing coming. What'd you do to my kid? What, I, they, uh, they were crying when they, I, what? We got, I'm not helping here anymore. Well, then you weren't helping for Jesus. You were doing it for you. By the way, pastors quit every Monday because of that same thing. All right, number two, number three. Expect old habits to battle the new self. We have old habits, old ways of doing things. I got a brand new lawnmower a few months ago. I didn't think it had reverse. No, no, I really didn't. I couldn't find it. I got the manual out. I read it. I couldn't figure out what it was talking about. So I would pull it into the garage and I would pull the little thing on the bottom and push the lawnmower out of the garage. And then I would not go anywhere that I couldn't back up, that I had to back up. I would just go around and around the yard. I did that for days, days. Kyle's over the house. I said, Kyle, I don't think this thing has a reverse. He's like, dad, that is a brand new lawnmower. It has got to have reverse. I said, well, where is it? He looks at the and he goes, it's on the pedal. So what do you mean it's on the pedal? It's just a pedal. There's a brake over here. 
I said, what, do you pull it up? He's like, no, no, you don't pull the brake. It's, it's over here. So what do you mean? The pedal goes both ways. You push it this way and it goes backwards. So Kyle's standing there. I start the lawnmower. I push it. I go backwards. I'm like, I've been pushing this thing around the yard by hand. Some of you live your Christian life that way. God has given you the power to overcome all this stuff, and yet you're still driving and thinking, well, i got to push it out of here. That's how I've always done it. I'm going to control my flesh with my own self. Measure up. And you're miserable, and you can't figure out why. Listen to what Paul says. He sounds miserable here. I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree the law is good. Isn't this awesome? It's just like us, like arguing with yourself. Like, why did I just say that to them? You ever do that one? You ever like, like say, like, okay, when I get on I-4 today, I I'm going to just love people. I'm going to pray for them and ask Jesus to help them. And then you merge off 408. And then they do things that you've never seen before. They try to kill you. It's them. They're trying to kill you. So you begin talking to them in ways that have nothing to do with righteousness. And then later, you realize, well, I, I didn't want to do that. Why did I do what I didn't want to do? Why do I eat those cookies? I didn't want to eat them. I told New Year's, oh, I'm not going to eat any cookies. Oh, those cookies are good. Those little Girl Scouts, little demons come to your house. <laughs> Sent by Satan. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm offending everybody today. For I know the good itself doesn't dwell in me. That's my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what's good, but I can't carry it out. Hey, how many people said, I'm going to work out every day? You heard the story about the eight crows on the fence? And the eight crows decided they were going to get off the fence and fly away? You know how many crows are still left on the fence? Hey, <laughs> deciding doesn't do anything. You got to decide. You got to do it. Who will rescue me? I love this. What a wretched man I am. You ever been there? You look in the mirror and you're like, oh, man, I gotta, we got to do something about this. You ever say something and right afterwards you're like, oh, I just gave in to that impulse. I, oh. This is how addictions form. We start with a habit and it develops an addiction and then we can't get out. And all of us know somebody who died from an addiction. All of us do. Young people. Young people. I know young people. Students, who, people who were my students in school died before they were 19 because of addictions. They were desired, but they didn't, didn't follow through. So Paul says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Now the good news is if you go into the next chapter, it basically says you have been freed. God has freed you. We're going to talk about that next week. So the last thing I want you to do today is learn how to rest. Learn how to rest. You've, you've, you've exhaled. You've said, God, I need your forgiveness. You've inhaled. God, fill me with your spirit. And then I want you to rest in the gift he's given you. When's the last time you really took time to thank God for salvation, not earned by you. See, we tend to focus too much on, on our little list. Whatever your list is of what you should do or what you shouldn't do. Or, that's your list. That's not God's list. You know what God's list says? I love you. You're like, but I blew it. And he's like, I know. Forgive me. Now I don't know. Says he, he puts it as far as east is from the west. He forgets what you just told him. That's awesome. I love when God's forgetful. He loves you just as much before and after you sin. And so we say, God, would you forgive me? God, I want to be filled with your spirit. God, help me to rest in you. And when you do those three things, you'll be able to love people more. You'll be a better spouse. You'll be a better husband. You'll be a better wife. You'll be a better coworker. You'll be a better boss. Because you'll deal with things the right way, not out of selfishness and self-centeredness, but God will give you clarity. Even the hard decisions that you make will not be done in anger, they'll be done in love. Even when you have to tell your kids they have to wash the dishes, it won't be just because you're mad. Because you've learned how to rest in Him and to walk in His grace. Exhale, inhale, 
and rest. You don't have to live in your old self. You don't have to keep pursuing sin or the law, trying to please God. You can enjoy the gift of God and begin eternal life today. If you're a Christian, you've already started eternal life. When you go to sleep here, you'll wake up in heaven. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. And if you want to do that, I'll be here after the service. We don't do a formal invitation where people come forward, but I'll be here. And you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. Maybe you're here and the truth is you're struggling with one of these areas. Hey, just make it right with God. And once you make it right, rest in him. Maybe you have to make something right with somebody else. Oh, you're not going to rest till you get that right. Well, do your best. The Bible's, um, I love what they say in um, some of the recovery classes. They say, make things right as long as it doesn't hurt the other person. And so you do right. Maybe it's somebody who's passed away that you just need to forgive. Maybe you write them a letter and burn it and say, God, I give that to you. I surrender that area to you. Whatever God's dealing with you, whatever area of your life, just let him deal with you today. Don't walk away from that. And then rest in him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you that we can confess our sins to you. We can be honest with you. We can surrender all things to you. And then you say, as you fill us with your spirit, we're able to carry out the service you've called us to. So Lord, I pray for each person here that they would recognize that what you've called them to do is not just here. It's in their homes. It's at their workplaces as they stand in line. And Father, that everywhere they go, they could rest in your presence, knowing you love them. Even when they fail and falter, that you forgive us through that free gift of salvation. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, for everyone watching today, those who are struggling, for the one today who's watching that was just given a new kidney, I thank you for that new life. I pray, Father, that you would bless her, that she would feel your strength this morning. Now, Lord, bless this time as we're together, as we give an offering to you. In Jesus' name, amen.